Well, good afternoon and welcome to students, prospective students, curious people and friends we haven't met yet. We're here this afternoon to meet the professors for the summer courses in the graduate program of Signum University. These courses lead to a graduate diploma or a Master of Arts in Language and Literature. And we hope very much that people will ask questions today in the chat box or else the only questions addressed will be my own. And here is a link to this particular slide set. Um, Gabriel Shank, would you please add that in the chat box? What I have learned is that folks who use a screen reader would love to have a link to the slides so that their screen readers can help them see what is on there. If you are using a screen reader, the questions and patter that we're using today are at the bottom of the slide in the speaker notes. Once you have shared that link, Dr. Shank, would you be willing to move us on to the next slide? Thank you very much. I am thrilled to present Sarah Brown, pronouns she, her. Her master's degree is in international history from the London School of Economics, a fact which amuses me and delights me every time. She completed her PhD in literature at Salford University, and she is the lecturer for this summer's course, Tolkien in Context, Middle Earth as a Roadmap to 20th Century Anxieties. This course explores Tolkien's writing as a response to modernity. She currently serves on the editorial board of Malorn, the academic journal of the Tolkien Society ask her about the gold standard. This term, Dr. Brown will be precepting both the Tolkien in Context course and the Dystopian Tradition course. Where are you broadcasting from today, Professor Brown? And what is the weather? Hello, Shumai Nosweta. Good evening. Rafael Sparrow, nice to see you. Uh, I'm speaking from Wales. Martuith and Hoylog Edio. The weather today is sunny. Uh, Sututi, how are you doing? Oh, very well. Thank you. And my heart is full. <laughs> Just a reminder, everyone, we are an international university with wonderful students and professors and staff from all over the world. So, okay. Next, may I present Dr. Paul Peterson, famous poet and scribe. His pronouns are Haun, Haun, Honnum, and Hans. And Dr. Peterson was thawed in 1998 from the ice that had calved off of the leading edge of Vatna Yokel Glacier. He was able to continue and complete his degree in contemporary Icelandic studies from the University of Iceland, although by that time they were called medieval Icelandic studies. Between nicknaming his hundreds of ever so great nibblings in Old Norse and buying a brun coup in Frisia, Dr. Peterson is co-chair of the language and literature department of Signum University. This term, he's one of the team of preceptors for Germanic myths and legends. Where are you broadcasting from today, Professor Peterson? And may we have a weather report in the language of your choosing? Hi, everyone. So I'm broadcasting to you from the cloudy and still slightly cold state of Minnesota. Um, in the upper Midwest, spring has just started. Uh, it might still snow again probably in the next week or two. It's always a possibility. Um, and I'm quite happy to be here. I can Jag tar det här på svenska, men nu är vädret inte så så fint det är vår ändå, men det kommer bli sommar snart. Så jag kan ta det in Swedish, if you guys prefer, or eller i isländsku, så jag kan speak a little bit of Icelandic and Swedish. Um, so those are kind of my two go-to languages, and a little bit of German, Deutsch, ist ausgezeichnet auch. Uh, if anybody wants to learn that one. Um, so I work in all of our Germanic philology courses and um, 
Uh, so I'll be co-teaching this one with uh, my dearest colleague, Carl Edlund Anderson, who would be joining us from Columbia, of all places, the country. Um, so glad to be here. Just fantastic. Thank you so much. And Takako has asked the perfect question in the chat. When will we have a Welsh course? <laughs> and I think the answer is keep your eye on space modules. Space is the not for credit, all for fun, one month mini courses that a different part of Signum University presents. And it's a great place for preceptors to field test ideas about things that we want to teach. So please keep your eyes open. Um, and, and now that we know Dr. Brown could lead us in such a course. We're, we're going to send encouragement and bribes and chocolate in that direction. <laughs> Gabriel, would you please iterate the slides? Thank you. Um, is I don't think that Dr. Anderson is here right now, but he is he him is the other half of the Germanic myths and legends team with an A B in folklore and mythology. The, 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 the names of all the universities here is always delightfully fun. Folklore and mythology from Harvard College and a PhD from the Faculty of English, Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic at the University of Cambridge. In addition to Germanic philology, his academic publications treat Colombian minority languages and cultures. How awesome is that? So there will be two discussion groups for Germanic myths and legends. One will be led by Dr. Peterson and one will be led by Dr. Anderson. So that's exciting. May we have the next slide, please? James Tauber, he, him is a philologist, a linguist, a software developer who works with scholars around the world using computers to better understand languages and texts. If you have used the Goldberry or Blackberry registration systems, you have seen James's work. As a scholar, he primarily focuses on corpus-driven historical language learning and heads up the Digital Tolkien Project, nominated for the 2022 Tolkien Society Award. Professor Tauber, you have recently moved, yes? From where to where? What is this adventure? And where are you now? <laughs> I've recently moved back to, uh, to the Boston area. I've actually lived, lived here for the last 20 years, but the last two years I was um, stuck back home in Australia. All right. Big adventures. Um, next slide, if you please. I am your host today, Sparrow Alden. My pronouns are she, her. I'm broadcasting on a beautiful sunny day from the lands of the Koasok Abenaki. All right, I'm going to ask uh, at this point, Gabriel, I think instead of sharing slides, we would just love to be looking at everyone's faces because now it's just interview questions. And I want to stop. Oh! Dr. Anderson, hello, you joined us. Would you tell yeah, us? Yeah, I thought little? I couldn't, but now I can. <laughs> it turned out. I was like, oh, wait, what time is it? <laughs> Good. So, where are you broadcasting from? And could you tell us a tiny bit about Colombian minority languages and cultures? <laughs> well, I'm broadcasting today from the lands of the Muisca people, I guess. That's where um, Bogota, Colombia is located. I'm a I've been living in Colombia the past 15 years or so. Um, I think I'm at about 9,000 feet. So despite the fact that we're about three or four degrees from the equator, it's um, chilly. Um, <laughs> and kind of in the rainy part of the year now. Um, <laughs> although the rainy part and the sunny part are not really that much different. Um, and uh, Colombian minority languages. Well, like I say, um, there's uh, there's a lot. Um, there's somewhere between 65 and 70 uh, surviving Colombian minority languages. Um, the one that was spoken around the capital is no longer surviving, although there are good records of it. Um, and it has uh, related languages elsewhere in the country. Um, 
Uh, the number of speakers in any of these 60 or so languages range from about, I think literally like one person up to several hundred thousand, so. Um, and but, uh, are there ongoing preservation work going for yeah. those, especially the smallest ones? The smallest ones, it's really hard to tell. Sometimes, you know, there's like one speaker and only the anthropologist who interviewed them knows about them. And so I don't know if there's much hope there. Um, but the ones that are, you know, in the, the tens of thousands to hundred thousand range are, um, you know, still in good shape. And there are kind of grassroots, at least efforts. There's some official government support. Um, it's all a little bit haphazard because the country has in the recent generation or so had other bigger things to worry about. But actually in the last decade or so, things have been a little more stable and a little more prosperous. So people can now in, indulge in things like um, trying to support minority languages. So I think it's it's slow. There'll probably be more lost before you know the surviving ones get more stable, but um, at least things are moving perhaps in better directions than they have been for the past 500 years or so. Okay. <laughs> so okay. there you go. Columbia minority Fantastic. languages. Done Thank you for letting us know about that. Um, the link is in the chat. If you want to know more about faculty and read about their research interests and find their email address so you can reach them at Signum University, then follow that link. Alrighty. James, you are the newest person joining the faculty here at the Graduate School of Arts. Can you tell us a little bit about your Signum journey? How did you start and how did you get here to the beginning <laughs> of digital text? And then yeah. I'm gonna make you explain digital text. Absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, my academic background is, is as a linguist. Uh, my, my focus for the last 25 years has actually primarily been in uh, ancient Greek. And um, I discovered in 2017, uh, first of all, that there were people that studied Tolkien academically, which was a life-changing revelation. Uh, but I also discovered that I could do Germanic philology if I, if I went to Signum. So I enrolled at Signum. Uh, I did a certificate in Germanic philology uh, with Paul um, and others uh, while working as a, a professional uh, software developer. Um, I then went on to do some software development for Signum. As you mentioned, I built uh, the Goldberry uh, student registration system for the MA program and, and BlackBerry for the space program. Uh, but right from the moment that I started as a student, I was really keen to, to at some point have the opportunity to share with Signum students what I've learned the last 30 years about working with historical and literary texts on, on a computer. And um, that's what led to me uh, teaching the digital text uh, course starting next month. People are so curious. So digital text, using the computer to examine text sounds like it could be interesting or it could be terrifying. <laughs> so boots on the ground, what yep. kinds of assignments and assessments are your students going to see? And, and yeah. someone might be listening who's wondering whether or not to do it. So let us know, just give us a glimpse. Sure, sure. So did, it, this is all part of a, a larger field called digital humanities, um, but we're focused particularly on the preparation, annotation and analysis of, of texts with a computer. Um, one of the most exciting things about digital humanities uh, broadly is that it's such an interdisciplinary endeavor. And so it's important to know a little bit about a lot of things. You know, there's things from linguistics, from library science, from computing, from statistics. And what I, I'm trying to do with this course is give people a gentle introduction to lots of different facets, lots of different concepts um, that are involved in dealing with a particular literary and historical texts on a computer. So that's going to range everything from learning, learning about character encoding, typography and fonts, how search works, how to do text annotation, uh, how to find out word frequencies and, and how different words are used in a text, building concordances. We'll spend a lot of time on markup and markup languages, as well as look at some of the legal and ethical issues 
in uh, dealing with texts digitally. And we're going to do that all in the context of working with a text that interests each student. Um, so there will be some short assignments that focus on concepts and also reviewing some existing digital projects that are out there to give people a sense of the sort of things that get done. But the main project is going to be the preparation of a text of your choice, uh, whether it's uh, like a 19th century novel or, or Old Norse or Old English text, uh, whatever interests you, um, but prepare that on a computer, do some annotation and, and analysis. But I do, want to, I do want to stress, you know, there's no expectations at all about uh, past experience, certainly on the technical side of things. Um, if you do want to work with an Old Norse or Old English or, or other Germanic language uh, text, then you probably should know a little bit about that, that language. Um, but otherwise, there's no expectations. This is really about introducing you to all the concepts and, and also giving you some practical experience uh, working with, with a text that, uh, that you are interested in. Oh, how fun. Okay, so uh, interdisciplinary. We're about to ask an interdisciplinary question. What I do know is that this course counts as a language course for those of you who are doing the Master of Arts program and you need to take two language courses, at least two lang, at least two lit of your total of 10 courses. However, it does not count toward the Germanic philology concentration unless your big project, your work is with one of the Germanic languages. So Professor Peterson, I would love to ask for clarification. Does it need to be a historical Germanic language? Could it be a current Germanic language? And what languages are those? Oh, geez. Okay, so Germanic philology doesn't start you know, when the first texts are written in Germanic languages like runic or, or Gothic texts, and then okay. and then end at the magical year 1500 when we say the Middle Ages end or something. It goes to today. So any Germanic language except for English, modern English, could count um, so, towards the Germanic philology concentration. Sure. Absolutely. Dutch, Yiddish, Afrikaans, German, any of the Scandinavian languages, um, Icelandic, Faroese, um, um, Gothic, Gothic, Saxon, Old Saxon, old, old English, Old Saxon, Old Norse, Old High German, Old Gutnish, you know, whichever, whatever Gutenish? people prefer. Who it's spoke Old Gutnish? Old Norse. It's a dialect of Old Norse or any runic language, which old could Goots. be, yeah, the Old Goots, of course, the Goot daughter. <laughs> Yeah. Where do you think the Goths come from? Um, uh, one ethnonym in common. But yes, um, I would say that, it, that any language except for modern English would count towards the Germanic philology uh, concentration because this is something we do. This is one way to apply it. This is a new skill that we are not able to teach currently. So it's, it's, it's an expansive topic. And I think James is perfect for this role, by the way. We're so happy to have him teaching this. Yeah, Elvdalska, by the way, also Carl noted. It's a dialect of Scandinavian or a language standalone. It exists in Sweden, but it's its own descendant from Old Norse. Oh, Definitely wow. Elvdalska, if anyone wants to do that. Elvdalska, very beautiful. Oh, lost fun. forest language, supposedly. It's not lost, but it is in the forest. Lost the, the okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <gasps> Oh, how delicious. Okay, fantastic. And what the other thing that I know, James, would you please affirm how many lectures are there per week and how many group discussions per week would a student have? Yep, so there's going to be two lectures and uh, two uh, meetings of each section. And so, you know, the lectures will primarily sort of cover conceptual material. And then in the preceptor sessions, we'll have the opportunity to discuss those concepts and, and apply them uh, to particular texts. Oh, thank you so much. So this course for any individual will meet four times per week, except if you're a premier auditor, that means you get to go to the lectures and you're not doing projects and you're not going to the discussion group. You just let the words sort of wash over you and absorb the goodness at your own pace 
So if you are a premier auditor, you're only coming twice a week to those fabulous lectures. Yes, and they're each each one hour long. So the lectures are one hour, and the uh, the preceptor sections are each uh, each one hour as well. Fantastic. So four, four hours a week. Yep. All right, then may I shift the spotlight to Professor Brown? You are the lecturer for the Tolkien in Context course, and those lectures have already been recorded. So this term, you'll be a preceptor in that course. If we've been around Signum for a while, we understand that distinction. But would you please explain that for those of you, for those of us folks in the audience who are not yet familiar with that difference? Okay, no problem. So the lecturer is literally the person who delivers the formal lectures that happen usually for a literature course twice a week, um, and they're usually around 90 minutes long. Um, preceptor is the one that leads the discussion session. And uh, in a literature course, you will usually have one one hour discussion session per week. Sometimes the lecturer is also a preceptor as happens in this case. And sometimes we have a lecturer and they choose not to precept their own course. Um, now that often happens if it's a course that was lectured a little while back, like for example, when we talk about it, the dystopian tradition, which was um, produced and lectured by Amy Sturgis, of course, and she is not precepting those classes. But in this particular case, I am both the lecturer and the preceptor. So bless your hearts, you're going to be hearing a lot of me if you're in my session. <laughs> um, is this a model that you've found at many different institutions? Is it, a, is it a European idea? Is it pretty distinctive and idiosyncratic? Uh, well, having um, preceptor sessions and lecture sections. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's pretty common here in the UK okay. um, in that it's common to have on any particular literature course, you'll have formal lectures that you attend and then they're usually called seminars um, where you will have a teacher that leads that seminar. And sometimes it's the same person who delivered the formal lecture that week. And sometimes it's not. It just depends on um, how it's being arranged. But um, it's relatively common here in the UK. I can't speak for in the US. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and for this course, in preparing all this lecture content, may we assume that you drew on your expertise in economics and history as well as literature? And what other foundation stones of knowledge came into that as you were preparing? Well, um, Really sensibly, looking back, um, I studied at university both English and history uh, for my first degree. And I'm looking back thinking what a sensible person I was choosing those two because they go together like uh, peanut butter and jam. So um, that to me has always helped me in how I've approached uh, pieces of literature because I do love to see the historical, cultural, social, et cetera, context to a piece of work um, uh, rather than seeing a piece of work floating in some kind of vacuum uh, untouched by the world in which it was produced. So um, my first degree was in English and in history. And then as you so kindly pointed out at the start of this, my master's degree is in international history, politics and economics. Why not? Um, and so, yes, um, that has given me um, an overview of all sorts of things going on in the world in particular time. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I was drawing on a lot of that knowledge when I was producing this particular course, because uh, when you are looking at Tolkien in the context of what's going on in the 20th century, then you want to talk about um, what's going on actually within Britain, but also what's going on for Britain within the world, Britain's own context within world events, how uh, it is being affected by what's happening around it. You also want to look at social change. Um, so you've got two world wars, 
that's not going to have zero effect on society. What does that do? Um, and so we talk about things like that. And alongside that, it's um, things like looking at the changing place of women in society as we move through the 20th century. I also look at emigration. Um, some people um, have this belief that emigration only really started into the UK with the Windrush generation in the uh, late 1950s into 1960s, and that is not true. In actual fact, it was happening a long time before that, at the turn of the century. In fact, we started getting um, many, many people coming from outside of Britain uh, to work here. Well, what has that got to do with anything? That's great. That's a history lesson. Fantastic. But we're on a Tolkien course, right? Well, Tolkien, of course, is, is sitting there in the 20th century, being affected by everything, as anybody is, by what is going on around them. Um, here we are in 2022. I think it's still 2022. Uh, and, you know, everything that is happening, the economic situation, the war in Ukraine, um, you know, politics in your own country, I mean, you name it, it has an effect on you, whether you realise it or not. And for someone like Tolkien, who was really sensitive to what was going on around him and had also seen through two world wars, what I look at is resonances. So how do we see all of these events resonating in his writing, not putting an equal sign you know, the Nazis equal orcs or anything like that, not doing that. It's not as simple as that. Um, but looking at how we can see um, the things that are happening around Tolkien in his lifetime, how are those resonating within the text? And that's what the course is about. That is, I am so excited for this course to run. Okay, question. Will there be some discussion of store migratory push and pull factors? Thank you. Maddie Proudfoot Muller. <laughs> well, we do talk about um, movement of peoples from place to place uh, within um, particularly the Lord of the Rings, um, but also the Silmarillion. We're, we're looking at what happens when people move from place to place, what effect that is having on them, what effect it has on the place in which they're moving, what does that mean for those people, what does it mean for the text. So yes, we do talk about migratory movements um, within the text itself, as well as emigration. Um, we, we look at the way in which um, you know, peoples are leaving Middle Earth and we look at the way in which people sort of enter Middle Earth. And again, it's about how that is resonating with what's going on in the real world around the text. Oh, my. Oh, delightful. You excited to teach it with me, Sparrow? I am actually very excited. It, folks, I am going to be one of the preceptors for this course this summer. And it's a course that is new to me. So I've got a great deal of excitement and fresh learning and fresh eyes. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we have, okay, these lectures have already been recorded and the same for the Germanic myths and legends class. So I'm going to ask Takako's question of Drs. Anderson, Peterson, and Brown, whoever leaps on it first, or maybe a piece of advice from each of you. What's your advice in how to take notes for recorded lectures? Is I've, I've got this recording, I can watch it. Uh, how do I make this work? Well, I can start and then I can pass over to uh, Prof. Peterson and Prof. Anderson. Um, for me, the beauty of having a recorded lecture is the pause button. Um, <laughs> it's a fantastic tool. That means that when the lecturer has made a point and you think, oh, oh, I really want to do something about that. The one thing you can do with a recorded lecture that you can't do with a live lecture is you can pause the lecturer and then you can stop and then you can make whatever notes you want. You can even rewind the lecturer if you need to hear that all over again. But the pause button is your friend. Um, if there's something you really want to make a note of, don't let me keep rambling on in this lecture. Pause me uh, and, and get on with it. Um, Takako is saying too many pauses uh, um, end up taking an awful lot of time. Sure, but you probably find that you won't need to pause it too often 
Most of the time it's about just, you know, listening to what's going on, making a few bullet points for yourself. Um, and then after you've listened to the lecture, go back to your bullet points and think over them and add, flesh them out a little bit on what you've listened to. But if there's something particular that you think, no, I really, really need to stop and do that, then use the pause button. Yes, you don't want one lecture to last six hours, that's insane. But you, you, can, um, you can use the pause button a few times just to make sure that you've absolutely got uh, a point that the lecturer is making. That's my okay. advice and I'll pass over now. Yeah, I would just add to that, although I'm really the worst note taker in the world, I would just add to what Sarah said that um, if you don't wanna interrupt the flow too much, you can always just note down the time you know, oh, at, you know, 10 minutes and 57 seconds, I thought of something and then let it go. And you can always then go back and check, oh, what was I wanted to say? What did I want to make a note of it? 10 minutes, 57 seconds. Well, go back to 10 minutes, 57 seconds, listen again and make your note. So you can do that too. Nice. Prof. Peterson. I have no further advice, except I think the beauty of pre-recorded ones is you can go back and send it to the original lecturer and say hey you screwed this up this was a mistake and you can call them on their mistakes and you right there 10 minutes those. and 57 seconds you made a mistake that was my note exactly it's a very good way to keep us on task as lecturers it's <laughs> no stress james um no uh but 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 in in seriousness i think you remember sometimes these these moments of incomplete thoughts that weren't fully formed. And then those are things that you can make a note of and bring to your discussion section. In some ways you could do that in the live version, but the difference is, is as we noted, you can go back and double check. Did they really say that? Was that really completely wrong? Or did they just make a mistake? I mean, there's things like that that happen all the time. So I, I, don't, I think that your study habits will be self-governed. You can take as little or as much time as you want but set your own time limits. I would certainly not expect to spend more than double the length of the original recording reviewing that recording. That would be the most for the note taking portion. Absolutely. And I would like to add in something that I've suggested to my students. At the beginning of each lecture, I keep the lecture notes for the entire course in one document. But at the beginning of each lecture, I put the bibliographic citation for that lecture, like Brown comma Sarah uh, quotes, lecture 12, the dog in the woods, close quotes, period. And then name of the course in italics, Sigma University and the date that it was recorded. That way, when you go back through your notes and you're quoting Dr. Brown, because what's the worst part of any paper? Doing the darned work cited page. Bibliographic citation is already written, copy, paste, done. And the second thing that I suggest to people, I like to take notes if I've got my laptop with me. On the laptop, this is the fact, this is what's coming at me, what I'm understanding. If I suddenly have an aha moment or a creative idea or wait, this relates to that thing we were reading in old Saxon class, that, where are my pens? Don't know where my pens are. Is handwritten in your little blank notebook that stays over here. So it engages a different part of your brain and now you've got a place where all your cool ideas were. And, ooh, Noam, excellent point. Changing the play speed to suit your taste. I know that, for example, an Amy Sturgis lecture takes a long time to get through because her massive and extraordinary encyclopedic brain compresses everything into a diamond and we have to unzip the file to get all that information back out. Takako, fabulous question. Thank you, and Noam, great advice. Okay, okay, back to professors Anderson and Peterson. You both teach language courses, and now and then a lit course. I noticed that Germanic Myths and Legends is a literature course. What are we expecting for content? What's fun? And how is your approach to a lit course different from a lang course? I go, what do you got? 
Oh man, so this is this is an expansion of our language courses, really, because we read little bits and pieces, small sections of some of this literature, and we don't get to read the, the, the full works. I mean, that's kind of the whole point is it's taking those works that we read little excerpts from, snippets of, and expanding them, reading them in translation, learning the broader field, connecting the pieces across the, the pan Germanic world, which a lot of these legends are found in bits and pieces across several different cultures, you know, even, um, uh, you know, uh, all the way from Southern Europe to Iceland, pretty much everywhere in between. Um, so we are, we are kind of tying together a, a large range of these works we already read. So for example, we read the entirety of Beowulf in our second Old English course, complete work all the way from line one to the end. Well, reading that in translation is actually a good way to kind of uh, follow up with that, but also just to, to introduce the topic in the bigger picture. I think we read Beowulf in like half of Signum's courses or something like that. So you hyper hyperbolic, but not exactly because it's the most important medieval work probably in, in, in many contexts, especially within uh, Tolkien studies and, and, uh, and Germanic philology. Now we have all of these other works and we have to connect the pieces. So when we, we hear about things like Beowulf and the poetic Edda, which are the poems of, you know, the, the Vikings more or less in a nutshell. I know it's, it's oversimplifying it, but the old Norse myths are contained very uh, well compared to other non-existent mythologies that aren't attested well in the Germanic world. So we get a kind of incomplete picture, but we get a picture of the myths of, of the Norse people we call, and pop culture call them Vikings. And we can kind of apply that to the Germanic world as a whole. We have, we know that there was, there were religions, very similar um, uh, cultic practices across the Germanic world that stem from a similar religion that descends all the way back to very ancient Indo-European traditions of the same nature. Um, so some of those are, those issues are, are brought into this course kind of um, looking at myths and then legends as a separate thing. So myths deal with non-humans, legends deal with humans. And there is some interaction between the two, uh, but we kind of have a large approach to this one is, is looking at this from you know, old English literature to old Norse literature to middle high German literature, uh, like the Nibelungenlied. Um, we, we even look at um, Waltarius, which is a Latin text. It's actually quite old and quite good. Uh, Legends of Walter of Aquitaine. So there is a lot of literature that's covered here. And we take this, this um, exact same approach that we use in, in philology generally anyway in our language courses and, and look at these in the kind of micro scale. Um, the only difference is that we're able to add that macro level analysis that we can't quite do in our language courses exactly because um, we're learning new languages and uh, you can, our, our time is more limited than when we're translating from those. So um, one thing that I can say, so this is a pre-recorded course. Um, this is a super group of lecturers. So I officially have my name on it, but I only, uh, gave 11 of the 24 lectures. So officially, I didn't even give half of them. Carl was uh, the second most uh, productive participant in the lecturer crew. Uh, Nelson Goering also uh, took a good number of them. And Larry gave, I think, two of them. Uh, Larry Swain also, uh, one of our faculty. So. so I think, yeah, so we had just kind of a super group here of this one. This was a best of, you know, drawing in all of our experts, um, not just myself, because I want everyone to hear other people's opinions. Carl has very, uh, a very advanced background in this uh, material as well. So, um, and Nelson came in with his own perspectives, which were, um, you know, enlightening for all of us. So we were kind of doing this as a team taught effort. Um, and that's why I think now teaching this for the second time, um, Carl and I will each have a section. It's the way we ran it the first time. Um, you know, we, we check in together, we coordinate as, a, as, a, as, as preceptors to kind of see that we're covering similar material. Um, we got one question here in the, in, uh, from, from Scott. Uh, so what, what do the assignments and assessments look like? Um, 
So assessment is a dirty word, but assignment is perfectly fine. Um, assignments that we have in the course are oral. We have some oral presentations. Uh, we will actually have it uh, required two oral presentations per student, which will help guide our discussions. Um, and we will also have uh, two papers, one short and one long. Uh, short is like four to five pages, long is, you know, 10 to 12 pages, double spaced for both of those. So those will be kind of the assignments. The bulk of the work is really just reading the literature. Um, and we have some secondary texts, of course, some scholarship uh, to read to kind of help guide, uh, you know, uh, our discussions and, and guide the framework in which we can understand this literature. So um, that's, yeah, it's kind of an all in one. Yeah, we should emphasize that the it's, it's kind of hard to call it an assignment, but the participation in the weekly sections is really an important part of the class. Um, it's going to help everybody when they do those more obviously assignment assignments, like, you know, writing your paper and giving your presentation. That's what we talk about stuff in order to help people do. And oh. yeah, I just emphasize what, what Paul said, the Germanic myths and legends course is, you know, literature and translation. Most of our Students, I think, probably read slightly faster in modern English than they do in Old High Saxon or something. So we can get more ground covered. By no means do we get a chance to do everything. There is a lot of um, medieval Germanic literature, um, especially in the Old Norse side. Um, so, you know, we're getting at least a taste of everything and hitting important points. And then, of course, in the language courses, we really have two kinds of language courses. There's the courses that are really about learning the language, like the introduction to the Old Norse course. And then we often have courses which, um, once students have got a certain amount of comfortableness with the language, we do more reading. But even then, I mean, yes, our Beowulf, the Beowulf course, you read all of Beowulf. Um, but when our Edic poetry course, we can't even read all the Edic poetry in a 12-week course. We can't even read more than a small percentage of the edit poetry, let alone everything else. So, but that's, you know, we do have those options. We're hoping to keep expanding them. So oh, something for so everyone. Much fun. Thank you very much. And a question from Scott grew out of this consideration of Germanic myth and legend, but the question's addressed to Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, do you think, but let's not make it a yes or no question. Let's make it how do you think an understanding of myths and legends as non-human and human, which was a distinction that Prof. Peterson just made, how does, how does this apply to Tolkien, understanding of myths and legends? That's an excellent question. Um, I mean, for example, if we're looking at the Silmarillion, uh, where most of the stories are uh, about elves and therefore not human, um, therefore, I think we can look at the Silmarillion as therefore mythology. But I'd be interested to hear what um, Prost Peterson and Anderson think of that. Go ahead, Prof. Peterson and Anderson. Uh, am I allowed to say something too? Oh, please. oh James, yes. come on in. Come on in. <laughs> no, I've just, I'm, I, I, it just made me made me think of, of the the part of the letter to Milton Waldman. Mm -hmm. where, where Tolkien says that most of the stories of the Silmarillion are about elves. That's the primary thing he wants to tell, but he has to get men in there somewhere because he's, because he's a man. There's this mm -hmm. sense in which there's certain things he can only convey from the stories of humans versus what he can convey um, from the stories of, uh, about elves. Mm -hmm. True. All righty. All righty. Germanic profs. Well, Tolkien is, is a bit complicated because definitely all of his, um, most of his stories are about elves and then there's humans and we don't worry about that as much in real world mythology. Yes, there are some elves and dwarves and things in Norse myths, but they don't usually have leading roles. Um, the reason that mythology and legend gets divided up that way is because um, it's somewhat arbitrary and scholars like classifying things, but it's a useful classification. We talk about myths are things that um, happen in some sort of very distant, remote time before time almost. Uh, and they explain important things about the cosmos and how things came to be. Mm. Um, and that's something, you know, that you see in earlier parts of the Silmarillion, like the, 
Ainulindale, or however you pronounce mm -hmm. that. Um, my Quenya isn't as good as it should be, probably. Um, but you, you know, you get an explanation for how the world came to be, and Tolkien's Balar are essentially his replacement for the kinds of gods you get in um, European mythologies. He's a bit more explicit about that in his earlier writings, um, but. Um, that's what myths are for. They happen in the dim and distant past and they explain how the world came to be. And then legends happen are happen in um, a world much more like our own. Um, in the past, um, possibly with people who were more impressive than the people of today, but they're thought to have been things that really happened. And that's where, you know, that's also difficult for Tolkien because of course his elves are supremely literate and they live for thousands of years and they know what happened. Um, <laughs> And there's not much question about it. I was there 3,000 years ago. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> I guess it's not a legend then. Um, we have an eyewitness. Um, but legends, you know, fall into that, that period. They're humans, they're like us. Um, you know, they may have done more impressive, awesome things, but it's something that's supposed to have really happened and it explains something about the world, not in sort of a cosmic term, but more in, a, in human terms. This is how, you know, our tribe, you know, what they did in, you know, distant generations, but it was still our tribe as opposed to, that's what the gods did when they created the world um, or how they took tea with each other or whatever it was that the gods did. Um, gods, and of course it's messy um, because gods and humans do occasionally get together and do things, um, perhaps less so in Germanic mythology than in recorded Greek mythology, but, yeah, Tolkien is, is a bit special because he's he's riffing all that on all that, especially the Germanic stuff, um, and making it real. You know, oh, um, th this is what the Valar actually did. Um, you know, maybe the elves weren't there, but they have that on good account because they went and talked to the Valar. Um, <laughs> and then the elves were actually there and they wrote it down. And this is the scribe Pengaloth talking about whatever he did. And these are the chronicles and... Um, so I don't know, can elves have legends? <laughs> They're so well informed. <laughs> very, very true. One of the things that I love about legends as you explain the difference, it, it, they happen to, in a world really close to this one, in a time not so terribly far away, to people who were human, even though they might have been a yeah, they little were different from us. More famous. They were more celebrity, but they and were like they us. can, but they can be heroes. Right? Yeah. A god. Okay, they did this great thing. Fine. They're a god. But heroes in a legend are something we can aspire to be. And so and, and on also sometimes cues, be afraid sparrows of. crying. <laughs> Very good. All right, all right, all right. Okay. I don't want to leave out the fourth course that's running this summer. So Professor Brown, for the dystopian tradition, is it tradition? It is tradition, I don't have my reading glasses on, I'm sorry. But the original lectures were recorded by Amy Sturgis, who you mentioned before. What can you tell us about the course and about Dr. Sturgis and her approach to the material? Okay, well, Dr. Sturgis's approach to the material is encyclopedic. Um, I'm beginning to wonder if there's anything that Dr. Sturgis doesn't know a huge amount about, actually. Um, I've been lucky enough to precept on a, a significant number of her courses now, and I just enjoy the heck out of all of them uh, because she knows so much about wonderfully geeky things. Um, like Star Trek and Star Wars and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the dystopian one is um, it's darker. Um, it's looking at the ways in which fictional worlds are not in great places. And of course, like all good dystopian literature, it's reflecting the real world. So um, in this course, we are looking at some wonderful uh, literature, um, but we will also be looking at what it says about the world in which it was produced. Uh, what does it tell us? Um, conversations, for example, about how in the early 2000s, there was a sudden explosion in the number of um, teen fiction that was dystopian. Uh, Hunger Games, for example, et cetera, et cetera, Maze Runners, you name it, there were, there were loads of them. Um, why? 
why? Why was there suddenly this enormous number of uh, teen um, books being produced uh, in the dystopian genre? And th that, I think, is a really great conversation to have. So you get the recorded lectures from Dr. Sturgis, and then you get me um, talking about how these texts teach us quite a lot about our world um, and about the ways in which these particular authors are thinking about um, our world. Uh, there's always, I think, a lot to learn from a good bit of dystopian literature. So I'm looking forward to it anyway. Very good. Um, Professor Anderson, farewell, safe driving to pick up your wonderful <laughs> you. kid at school. And those- Duty calls. <laughs> Absolutely. Those of you who have found Dr. Anderson on Facebook will realize he's one of the coolest game mastering dads like ever. And so take care of that kid. Yeah, we're ready to go. <laughs> <gasps> awesome. Awesome. All right. All right. Catch Good you night. Later. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to wrap up in the next seven minutes. And so please, folks, send in your questions right now. Oh, so Dr. Brown, for the dystopian tradition, it's a lit course. What will the, uh, the assignments, the, the projects that students work on in order to work through their understanding and mastery of concepts, what will that look like? Okay, so uh, we will have a, um, just to match what uh, Prof. Peterson and Anders are doing, we'll do a short paper and a long paper. Um, but I do like doing uh, more oral based uh, assignments. So there will be uh, one class um, oral presentation to do. And I've already put up in the Google Classroom the sign up sheet for the week of your choice. So you can choose when you want to do that. Portacarco, more assignments. Um, and then there will be an exam uh, to do at the end, which I always do an oral exam for as well, because enough writing is enough writing. I think, you know, a short paper and a long paper, that's enough writing. With the uh, exam assignment, what I am going to be offering is an opportunity to present something creative, if you want. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to do something and then present what that something is and talk about your creative process with that. But I'll talk about that with the class later on. But I would like to um, bring in a creative, a little bit of a creative element with the assignments, um, just to, you know, have a bit of fun with it. Oh, just delightful. We are. Okay. 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 As I said, I'm going to be fresh eyes on the Tolkien in Context course um, and excited to look at the information resources Dr. Brown has pulled together. Oh, and wonderful signal lecturer, also known as the amazing Gabriel Schenk, has put in the chat a link to the summer class schedule. If we, if we suddenly had 20 new registrations between now and the beginning of the term on May 2nd, there would be other sections opening up, especially if y'all registered for the same thing and were available at the same time, that would be lovely. But as it is, that's the schedule as it stands. So onward, I wanna wrap up with my favorite question. And let's, Dr. Brown, if you could take, you're, you're, you're teaching two of them, if you could take one or both of the other courses, Germanic Myths and Legends and Digital Text, which one would you take this summer? You know, I would love to take the Germanic Myths and Legends. I really would, um, because I don't know enough about the Germanic myths and legends. And as somebody who's into Tolkien, that's a little bit shameful. So um, I would really love to do that tech, that uh, that course in all the spare time I don't have, right? In, in all the spare time that we don't have, fantastic. Alrighty, alrighty. Um, James? Yeah, Germanic myths. The yeah, Germanic myths and legends. I mean, I'm, I'm seriously on the on the brink of enrolling right now as a, as a as an auditor at least um yeah i mean i obviously 
dealt with the original language stuff in in some detail but to paul's point i think it would be wonderful to take a step back and, and just get a broader context read more um both in terms of the variety and also just the extent of each work uh would would be wonderful and it's something i'll definitely do at some point even though i don't have time now i'll i'll <laughs> i'll be an auditor at some point in the course someday right okay exactly. <laughs> finally professor peterson of the other three courses, what would you take if you had all the time in the world? Oh, man, I'd take all of them. I'm not kidding. I say it every time, but it's such an impossible thing to answer. I would really like to learn more about the dystopian tradition because that's my worldview, too, is that we are in it and it's getting worse and it's going to get worse. And I just see everything falling apart before my eyes. And I want to learn more about it on an academic level because I think, and just see the creative ideas, the brilliant work that's been done, um, you know, the, the literary output of people in the 20th and 21st centuries. It's been, it's something that I have studied the least. I'm not, I'm, I've never been interested in modern things until I saw the world unravel before my eyes over the last two years. And now I want to learn more about it. Um, because this is the worldview of, of medieval studies as we know that's what it was the entire time. It was always a chaotic, violent, horrible place to live, but they still produced all this great literature somehow. Um, and I see the same thing repeating itself. Um, you know, history does that. Um, but I would really also love to take James's course and, and learn a little bit more uh, about, you know, the kind of te digital textual editing I've, I've done the very basics of XML. And, I, and to me, it still looks a little bit like hieroglyphics, but that's kind of shameful for me as a philologist because that's the direction that the field is moving, um, producing digital uh, editions of, of our manuscripts. And, um, you know, this is something that in the field of Old Norse, which is my primary content area, that's something we've been doing now for over a decade. Um, and I'm the worst at it. And I could use some of those skills. So I think it's a really cool cool uh, topic and and useful skills in addition to kind of um, the, the really those hands-on skills are something that is uh, you know the best approach I think we could we could have so yeah all of this stuff and learning more about Tolkien every Tolkien course we have is awesome everybody knows that yes, so yeah absolutely okay a wrap-up question from Matt Muller has anyone found resonance diagrams or Venn, Venn diagrams or those multi-dimensional relationship diagrams overlapping Tolkien's legendarium and the dystopian tradition. We've talked about the overlap with myths and legends, but dystopia and Tolkien, wouldn't that? That's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not sure we can make the argument that Middle Earth is dystopian. Um, we could certainly make the argument that uh, certainly uh, in many places and times within the legendarium, things are going badly wrong, um, but there's a difference between that and actual dystopia. Um, I, I think that it's a, a bit of a separation there for me. Um, but there's certainly scope to examine the ways in which Tolkien's world um, at certain points in the narrative is going off in the wrong direction. And his narrative is working towards healing the way in which it's going off in the wrong direction. But I, I'm not sure I could make the argument that his world is dystopian in my humble opinion. Would you be willing to venture that because dystopic things happened in the 20th century and during Tolkien's lifetime, that there are resonances of that pain in his writing? There are definitely resonances of the pain of uh, war and um, social Loss. unrest, yes. things like that. Yes. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> which does not make Middle Earth a dystopian world. No. Um, it does mean that he explores some of the difficulties. Um, in fact, he explores them quite explicitly. Um, some of the difficulties that happen within the real world. Um, yeah, it would be a conversation I would love to have in class. Yeah. 
Uh, and I'm very open to somebody changing my mind. Why not? Absolutely. And that is the fun, my friends, of being scholars is we get to look at these marvelous texts and these marvelous backgrounds and these marvelous secondary sources and say, okay, crazy idea, change my mind and everyone wins <laughs> <laughs> at exactly the moment that Topper was posting it. Beautifully done. But let's see. Because the underlying assumption in Tolkien is that there is a divine goal that will be the that will be ultimately reached, could be different but not better. Unlike the dystopian worlds, which is a stable bad situation, could what an interesting idea to explore in a paper. I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, have, I have to be honest, I do, I, I do agree with what Noam is saying there, that that's, that's part of the way in which you could make the argument that Middle Earth is not dystopian because it does have a divine um, there with um, um, that idea of moving towards the divine and working towards the divine and healing is there, um, which pulls us away from dystopia, which usually leaves us feeling miserable. The, the ultimate hope and and then we need to explore why the dystopias are being written and why they're being read and yeah. how does that intersect with believing that there could be heroes mm -hmm. and that we could be them and again Sparrow's crying Sparrow's crying because Fast this content moves me so I'm mm. going to paste uh, our wonderful links into the chat one last time. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Brown, James Tauber, Dr. Peterson, and wonderful behind the scenes, Dr. Schenk in his guise as mild-mannered Signum lecturer doing all of the technology for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, Takako. And thank you all. Good night. Oh, register soon. Term begins May 2nd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bye, everyone.